Namaste. Well, we've been going over the Paticca Samupada. First, we describe the backward direction, how it was discovered by Vipassi Buddha. And then we went over, very briefly, the descending phase in the forward direction, forward mode. Now we're going to continue with forward mode and describe the ascending phase. So here it is so far. We see how someone goes from ignorance through the various stages all the way down to suffering and death. And usually what happens at this stage is that they simply go right back to ignorance again and start to make another body, another existence, another round of suffering in samsara. But there is an escape. There is a way out. And what has to happen for that escape is that ignorance has to disappear. And how does ignorance disappear? <laughs> One comes into connection with a realized being somehow or other, and gets educated in the science of transcendence. That's the only way. Otherwise, one remains stuck in ignorance. This is called putujana, or one who is uninstructed. One who is uninstructed by the wise is going to be stuck in samsara because of ignorance. The simple reason. But as soon as one comes in contact with a realized being and learns this science of transcendence, then one develops confidence. Now, sometimes this is translated as faith, but it's not shraddha. It's not shraddha. It's confidence. Because as we discussed before, the Buddha's teaching is verifiable. It's visible here and now, ehipasiko. So if you approach the Buddha's teaching and actually experience it, then you know it's true. And that's not a matter of faith. That's confidence. So what has to happen in association with suffering? One meets a realized soul and ignorance ceases. So the ascending phase each step has two conditions. One is the association with the previous stage, and the other is the fading away and disappearance and cessation of the stage on the opposite side of the circle. And we'll see this as we go one by one. What's the next stage? When Sankara ceases, then delight happens. Huh? I've experienced this myself. That normally our mind is very busy with all these plans, <laughs> most of which never happen, isn't it? Our plans and schemes and desires and wants and needs and so on. Uh, we have a very low batting average. <laughs> Sometimes somebody gets lucky. And they, these are the famous people, the rich people, the powerful people of the world. That their plans and schemes, because of their karma, uh, somehow they get what they want. But most of us really don't. So we have to realize that. And once we can relax or still those sankara, there's a kind of joy that arises, a peace that's very difficult to describe, of having no wants, no needs. We're not going any place. Huh? We stop this looking into the future for happiness and find it in the present. And the next stage is even better. Once conditioned consciousness ceases, then we can experience real joy. Because conditioned consciousness is suffering. Conditioned consciousness means consciousness with an object. 
And because all perceptions are basically painful, conditioned consciousness is suffering. It is described by my teacher, Nyanananda, as the backward uh, thrust against the flow of nature that causes the vortex. Uh, and in a future episode, we'll go over consciousness and name and form and how they form the vortex that entraps us in conditioned life. But anyway, let's go on. The next stage is when name and form disappear, and that's called serenity. Why is that? Because finally, the inner conversation, uh, the mind talking to itself, blah, 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 uh, that finally stops. And also all the dreams, the fantasies of different forms, the imaginations uh, of, for example, this body, thinking that this body is one unit, uh, which is not at all. It's a bunch of aggregates of different functions that happen to come together by laws of nature. So the same with the world. The world is simply an abstraction. It's simply a name that we give for convenience sake to a bunch of aggregates, different phenomena going on all on their own with no real connection to each other. Uh, but we lump it all together, <laughs> just like a corporation or a nation. These are also abstract aggregates. So when those uh, hallucinations disappear, we find peace. Next, when the six senses disappear, then we're at ease. Why is that? Because now we don't have to perceive anything. We don't have to go out and gratify those senses all the time. The senses are a real disturbance. They want this. They want that. They want so many things. huh? And they're afraid of other things. So they really boss us around quite a bit. When that finally stops, we feel at ease. We feel relaxed. We feel, oh... I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't need anything. Huh? Ramana Maharshi described this feeling as being greater than the greatest emperor in the world. Because there you have no needs. <laughs> now what's next? When contact disappears, then we get concentration. Now this is also described in the yoga system. When the senses are withdrawn from their objects, pratyahara. But nobody teaches this anymore as part of yoga. Huh? It's become unknown, very unpopular. Why? Most people can't do it. That's why. And the reason they can't do it is that they have not completed the previous stages Huh? The disappearance of ignorance, of sankhara, of consciousness, name and form. So because of that, the senses are always crying out to contact and they can't stop them. They become a slave of the senses. So of course you can't concentrate when that's going on. The senses are demanding different contacts all the time. But once the needs that drive those senses are removed, then they can simply relax. And this is the most wonderful, peaceful feeling. Next, feeling has to disappear and then knowledge can come. Why we don't have knowledge ordinarily is that we have so many feelings about everything. I like this. I don't like that. I don't care about this and that. Huh? These are feelings. So when these judgments disappear, which are all related to our desires, right? I desire this. So when this happens, then I feel good. Or if this doesn't happen, I feel bad. 
or something that I don't desire, if that happens, eh, meh. <laughs> but to have all these feelings is a constant disturbance to the mind. So how can you have knowledge when you have this mm, prejudiced point of view? that what I feel about everything is dependent on my desires, whether they satisfy my desires or not. So real concentration, rock solid, huh? unshakable, unstirrable <laughs> consciousness can only happen when we don't have all these feelings about everything. Next, craving has to disappear. When craving disappears, we get disenchantment. That, well, what is craving, first of all? Craving is a habit brought on by many contacts of the senses. Huh? I like the color blue, let's say. So I have blue shirts with blue pants, and I paint my room blue. <laughs> Everything is blue, right? I love it. But then... I lose my liking, my feeling about blue. Blue is just another color. So I become disenchanted. I'm no longer in love with blue. <laughs> it's just another color on the spectrum, ho-ho. And I become disenchanted. And this is a necessary stage because the next stage when grasping disappears is detachment. Grasping is the tendency of the mind to cling. Uh, the mind, based on feelings, likes certain things and doesn't like other things. So it, it clings to the things that it likes. And it tries to reject the things that it doesn't like. But well, what does this have to do with us, actually? <laughs> Not really a whole lot. It's, again the action of the senses. So as soon as we transcend those senses, as soon as we withdraw from the senses, as soon as our attachment to the senses disappears, we can let go of clinging. Because after all, as Ramana Maharshi pointed out, our karma is already bringing us all that we need to survive, all that we need to live. So we don't have to cling to the things we've got huh? because new stuff is always coming according to our karma. So if we just let our karma do its job, <laughs> then we have no worries. We can let go of all our clinging and especially clinging to the body, clinging to existence itself because these are the things that get us into trouble. These are the things that get us into the whirlpool of the vortex and keep us trapped in samsara, existence. The next stage now gets really interesting because becoming can disappear. And then we get emancipation. Once we don't have to become anything anymore, we have no goal in the material world to work towards. Uh, if there's no sankara, no antic commitment that I'm going to become this or that or the other thing, then we don't need to work to become anything. We can just be what we are and be happy with that. And that's emancipation. That's real freedom. No more a slave to sankara. Then birth disappears. And when birth disappears, that is extinction. Extinction of what? Extinction of conditioned life. Coming into the world, being forced to take a body, going through all that suffering, and finally growing up, and then trying to satisfy desires, being frustrated. You know, all this suffering in material life, it's terrible. So once birth is extinct, then we have real freedom. We have the freedom to be what we really are. And of course, the Buddha doesn't really say much <laughs> about what we really are. 
But when suffering and death finally disappear, then that's Nibbana, that's the final stage. So this is the ascending phase of the Paticca Samuppada. And in our next episodes, we're going to go in a more detailed way through the various stages and define the different terms, such as consciousness and name and form and so on. We already went over Sankara, I think, pretty well in previous series. So I'm not going to go far into that. But the other stages deserve some uh, exposition. And so we're going to provide that in the next episodes. Buddha Saranai.